substance of the webinar, and that is that um, if you've joined, please check your audio to ensure it's working properly. The signal for that would be that your microphone is the color blue. Um, that should indicate that you are able to hear and see properly. If it's gray, even if you're connected and you can see the list of participants and the messages, it might not mean it might mean you cannot hear optimally. And so, feel free to send me a message, and I'll work with you one-on-one uh, -on -one to try to correct that. The immediate solutions and uh, quick solutions would be to log in and out of the call again to restart your computer after you've downloaded the software. Um, and of course, if you have IT support available to you on site where you are to contact them and see if they can help you. And I'm happy to provide any support I can remotely. Um, so those are some housekeeping issues. And um, as many of you have joined us before, we will have uh, Q&A sessions throughout after some of the presentations, and I'll review um, the agenda with you as well. So we will have a, a introductions and a very brief overview of the top line messages from CROI, and then we will proceed into three of the presentations, after which we will break for a short Q&A. And then we will have two additional presentations, have a short Q&A, and then proceed to a little bit more of a broader, detailed summary of the main findings related to pediatric treatment and PMTCT, and then some Q&A after that. So the summary um, will not include the abstracts that will be presented, the more specific abstracts that will be presented uh, previously by our researchers who have graciously and generously uh, joined us. Um, so without further ado, I want to first of all recognize the work and collaboration of the Child Survival uh, Working Group, which is a working group of uh, various technical experts in pediatric uh, treatment and child health and survival, and from various organizations, UN agencies, uh, the US government, implementing partners, civil society members, so a wide array of uh, representatives who are part of this working group who help to uh, organize the webinar. Um, and some of the co-chairs are have joined us and have worked hard to uh, prepare the webinar, and they are Nandita Sugandi of CHAI and Nandi Puta of UNICEF and um, Molly Vivandera of CDC. Um, although she sends her apologies, she's traveling and could not join us today. Um, so uh, I think that is a, an overview, and we also want to recognize and acknowledge the support of Dr. Lynn Moffinson of currently with EGPAF and formerly of the National Institute of Health of the United States, who provided some of the summary slides you will see at the end of the webinar and graciously shared with us. Um, so we really appreciate her support and contribution to this webinar as well. Um, so without further ado, we'll briefly provide some framing for the main messages from CROI. Again, these are very general and will not reflect the nuance or do justice to the in-depth abstracts and presentations that were uh, presented, but it's just to give you a, a taste um, of what was shared and what will be discussed here. And so I think one of the um, main messages was that uh, there's some indication of the feasibility and effectiveness of birth testing and immediate treatment uh, for infants who were um, diagnosed HIV positive and the need to explore longer term outcomes in infants and children as they grow, but there's emergent evidence from both birth testing and treatment um, in infants that it's feasible and effective uh, with a few studies from South Africa. 
there were a lot of research presented about the use of different, different testing modalities, including self-testing, home-based testing, point of care for early infant diagnosis and STI do diagnosis with linkage to treatment support and partner notification as an important strategy and that may help reach vulnerable populations. There was also a lot of um, research presented on the importance of integration of care and relationships in improving adherence and retention, um, personalized one-to-one -one and community-based retention strategies including peer navigators, community-based testing, and community care cohorts, as some exam examples, seem to be effective at retaining people living with HIV in care and achieving viral suppression. Um, there was recognition of the STI epidemic in many countries and a push toward lab testing for diagnosis, giving growing evidence that syndromic management misses a significant proportion of infections. There was also a lot of discussion about um, pretreatment and acquired drug resistance as a growing concern, especially in sub-Saharan Africa, as well as the confirmation of the presence of low-level viremia in about one quarter of people living with HIV. Um, there was also the uh, lots of discussion about the expected youth bulge in many low and middle income countries, which poses a serious challenge, but as well an opportunity to controlling the HIV epidemic. Um, there was some data presented that by 2060, the world will have the largest population of adolescents driven largely by population growth in sub-Saharan Africa and Asia. And so the youth bulge and current HIV incident rates may equal epidemic growth as was um, presented early on in the conference. So these are just some of the top line uh, messages and we wanted to delve deeper into some of these uh, presentations that were especially relevant for this community working on PMTCT and pediatric treatment. So without further ado, I will turn it over to our first presenter, Dr. Rebecca Zash, who's an instructor in medicine at Harvard Medical School. She's an infectious disease specialist and associate director of the program in global health at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston and research associate at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and at the Botswana Harvard AIDS Institute Partnership. And she will be presenting on adverse birth outcomes that differ by ART regimen from conception in Botswana. So without any further ado, I'll turn it over to you, uh, Dr. Zash, to share with us your findings. Thank you, Jessica. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. I can. Great. Um, and, and thanks for the opportunity um, to share our research. Uh, and I'm presenting this on behalf of a, of a wonderful study team. Um, so just as some background for this uh, research, I think we would all agree, of course, that expanding access to antiretroviral therapy has been critical for PMTCT. Um, and really led the sharp global decline in pediatric HIV worldwide. Um, with the implementation of option B plus and a treat all approach, there are an increasing number of women who start ART prior to pregnancy. And there has been some significant research that showed that exposure to ART from conception may increase the risk of adverse birth outcomes, but it's really unknown if these risks might differ by ART regimen. So um, we undertook the Tsapamo study with the primary aim to compare the risk of adverse birth outcomes with in utero exposure from conception to the five most common ART regimens in Botswana. Um, and this is a planned two-year analysis of a larger four-year birth surveillance study. Um, and in this study, we abstract data from the maternity um, cards on all consecutive births, both HIV positive and HIV negative women, 
um, at greater or equal to 24 weeks of gestational age from eight maternity wards in Botswana, which represent about 45% of all births in the country. Um, Botswana is a, kind of an ideal study setting um, to do this study. They have a very high HIV prevalence, um, also very high uptake of ART in pregnancy, um, about 90%, um, and the vast majority, almost all women, deliver in a healthcare facility. The other um, unique landscape in Botswana is that there's a mixture of different ART regimens at conception. Uh, what you can see here is that in, in 2012, when Botswana switched from being an option A PMTCT program with primarily uh, zidavidine, 3 tc nivirapine to an option B program with uh, tenofovir, FTC, efavirenz, um, but HIV-infected adults who were stable on their regimen were not switched to newer regimens. So by 2014, when our study started, um, about 40% of women were on TDF, FTC, efavirenz, but still a high percentage of women, um, sorry, this is on at conception, were on um, both nivirapine-based regimens as well as lopinavir or based regimens. Uh, and I'll, I'll mention here that Botswana switched actually to TDF, FTC, dolutegravir in May of 2016, uh, but we didn't capture births from dolutegravir-based regimens uh, in this two-year analysis. So in terms of our statistical methods, um, we defined ART exposure from conception as a documentation of an ART start prior to conception, and the regimen was not switched or terminated in pregnancy. And we looked at eight different outcomes, um, including stillbirth, neonatal death, preterm and very preterm birth, small for gestational age and very small for gestational age, and two combined outcomes, um, any adverse birth outcome, which was a stillbirth, preterm, SGA, or neonatal death, and severe birth outcome, which was stillbirth, very preterm, very SGA, or neonatal death. Um, and we compared individual and combined outcomes by maternal ART regimens using a log binomial regression among singleton births only, and we adjusted for maternal age educational attainment, and gravida. So in the two years of our study, um, there were 47,124 births, and we were able to collect information on 99.8% of those. 25% um, of births were HIV exposed. Um, about half of those were uh, women who were on ART um, prior to their pregnancy, prior to conception. Um, among conception regimens, 43% were TDF, FTC, efavirenz, 13% were TDF, FTC, nivirapine, 24% were ZDV, 3TC, nivirapine, 4% were TDF, FTC, lopinavir, ritonavir, and 3% were ZDV, 3TC, lopinavir, ritonavir. In terms of the baseline characteristics, um, women on TDF, FTC, efavirenz tended to be younger, uh, while women on ZDV, 3TC, nivirapine um, tended to have lo a lower educational attainment, um, were less likely to be permipirous, and more likely to have had uh, greater or equal to five prior pregnancies. And this was true of women on lupinavir, ritonavir regimens as well. Um, I think, unsurprisingly, given the prior graph I showed of ART at conception in Botswana, women on TDF, FTC, efavirenz had a shorter duration of H from HIV diagnosis to conception and a shorter duration of time on ART prior to conception. Overall, the CD4 counts in this population were quite high, ranging from medium of 478 among women on TDF, FTC, efavirenz, uh, to greater than 600 among women on lopinavir, ritonavir regimens. And there were very few women in this entire cohort who had a CD4 count less than 200. So this is our main results. Um, and what you can see here in the bars is the total percentage of uh, adverse outcomes in the light bars and severe adverse outcomes in the darker bars. 
Um, and you can see uh, there's HIV unexposed in the light blue, and then individual ART regimens um, in the colored bars. Um, and I think uh, always worth noting here that the is a very high proportion of um, births with adverse and severe adverse birth outcomes um, in this population. In the uh, table below is the result of our adjusted analysis comparing outcome this outcome by um, conception regimens. And what you can see is that in adjusted analyses, the risk of adverse birth outcomes and severe adverse birth outcomes was significantly lower in TDF FTC efavirenz compared with all the other regimens. This is the results for preterm and very preterm births. Um, again, a very common outcome. Um, and in adjusted analyses, the risk of preterm and very preterm was significantly lower among TDF FTC efavirenz uh, than ZDV 3TC nivirapine and ZDV 3TC lopinavir ritonavir. And in this last regimen, uh, the risk of very preterm birth was more than double. Um, so results were fairly similar uh, for SGA and very SGA. Um, TDF FTC efavirenz was again associated with a significantly lower risk of both of these outcomes compared with all other regimens, with the exception of TDF FTC lopinavir ritonavir for the outcome of SGA. The rate of stillbirth was again lowest among women on TDF FT efavirenz, um, although the risk was only, um, sorry, the risk of stillbirth was more than double among women on ZDV 3TC nivirapine compared to TDF FTC efavirenz, and not significantly increased uh, on any other regimen. And then finally, for neonatal deaths, um, again, TDF FTC efavirenz had the lowest rate of neonatal death, uh, while ZDV 3TC nivirapine had almost twice the risk and ZDV, 3TC, lopinavir, ritonavir had four times the risk of neonatal death compared with TDF, FTC, efavirenz. We performed uh, multiple sensitivity analyses and didn't include all of them here, but um, we didn't find any substantial change in the association between ART regimen and either total or severe birth outcome when additionally adjusting for CD4 count in pregnancy time on ART prior to conception or time with HIV prior to conception. Our study had several limitations. Um, I think first and foremost, it's an observational study, so there could be um, unmeasured confounding. Um, this is our third birth surveillance study in Botswana, so we did try to collect as many potential confounders as we could uh, based on our prior research, and we looked at a lot of different factors, which I didn't uh, include in this presentation, um, but nothing seemed to change the um, uh, risk differences between our regimens. Um, it's also possible that uh, CD4 nadir could play a role, um, although we would have expected that the outcomes would be uniformly worse among women on nivirapine-based regimens, which is contraindicated uh, to start at higher CD4 counts, but this is not uh, what we found. Um, so additionally, we're unable to assess ART adherence or viral load in pregnancy. Uh, we didn't measure neonatal death outside of the hospital, and we were unable to measure early pregnancy loss. Um, but, but in conclusion, I think we can say that among women who became pregnant while taking ART, TDF, FTC, efavirenz was associated with the fewest adverse birth outcomes compared with other ART regimens in Botswana. Um, I think it's important to have expanded monitoring of pregnancy outcomes in different settings, um, particularly as newer ARVs uh, become available, and further research to understand the mechanisms of these adverse birth outcomes um, what is also needed. And again, just um, we have a great study team in Botswana, and uh, I want to make sure I recognize all of them. Thanks. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Zash. And we will um, run quickly into our next presentation, um, next two presentations, and after which we will break for a quick uh, Q&A. Each presentation is quite short, about 10 minutes each, so um, we hope that's amenable to everyone. Uh, without further ado, as I load the next presentation, I'll introduce our next presenter, Dr. Landon Meyer, who is professor and head of the Division of Epidemiology and Biostatistics um, and director at the Center for Infectious Diseases, Epidemiology and Research in the School of Public Health and Family Medicine at the University of Cape Town in South Africa. Um, so we'll turn it over to him to present on the integration of postnatal services improves MCH and ART outcomes, a randomized trial. Thank you, Dr. Meyer, for joining us. Great. Thanks, Jessica, and thanks for the invitation to present. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Excellent. I'll go ahead then. Um, so... Uh, before I get started, I don't have any conflicts of interest, and I wanted to acknowledge a, a very great team um, that I work with here in Cape Town and at Columbia University in the United States, um, and for their field. By way of background, everyone on this, this kind of webinar is going to be familiar with uh, the global expansion and access to lifelong antiretroviral therapy in pregnant and postpartum women as well as the, the quite significant concerns that have emerged around um, adherence to antiretroviral therapy among women receiving ART and retention and engagement of those women in services, particularly during the postpartum period. And so taken together, there's, there's quite a significant need for interventions that can help to improve maternal ART adherence and retention and care, and a lot of interest specifically and how models of care uh, may contribute to improving uh, women's health outcomes, especially during the postpartum period. And that's really the focus of this presentation. Um, in parallel to this, there's a lot of discussion, of course, in, in many circles around the integration of healthcare services, around it, uh, HIV prevention and, and treatment. And maternal and child health services in particular present quite a special opportunity, potentially to integrate HIV care and treatment, um, uh, particularly in the context of B+, where antenatal integration of antiretroviral therapy has been an important uh, pillar of, of success in implementing option B+. But during the postnatal period, there really haven't been um, very many explorations of the opportunities to provide maternal therapy um, within MCH platform. And in that context, we set out to compare two models of care to provide postpartum antiretroviral therapy to HIV-infected women, as well as care for their infants. Um, we, we examined providing maternal ART services integrated into an MCH art platform, and we're going to call that the intervention or the MCH art intervention. And we compared that to the local standard of care, certainly in, in urban areas of Southern Africa, which is to refer women immediately postpartum out from a, an MCH setting or from an antenatal setting to routine adult ART services where they would become um, undifferentiated uh, adults receiving ART. And we examined maternal and child health outcomes that I'll get to in a moment. We conducted a, a randomized controlled trial in the community of Guguletu, um, uh, a former township area outside of Cape Town, with a substantial population and a substantial burden of HIV in pregnancy. And participants in the trial were breastfeeding mothers who initiated ART during pregnancy and who were recruited into the trial um, almost always within seven days postpartum. So we, we tried to recruit mothers immediately postpartum um, into this trial. And all of these women, importantly, initiated an antiretroviral therapy antenatally in the context of, a, of an integrated ART service that w took place within the MCH setting. And so they initiated treatment within antenatal care, within antenatal clinics, and this is examining their postpartum management. So as I said earlier, the control condition was the transfer of women who were receiving antiretroviral therapy out of the MCH 
into general adult ART clinics immediately postpartum. The intervention um, that we tested was the retention of these mothers who initiated ART in pregnancy, retaining them in the MCH setting until the cessation of breastfeeding. And in both these arms, our clinical care package was based on the local standard of care, and it didn't vary between the two arms. The care providers were routine public sector providers. The follow-up of infants followed um, local standards and was, and was the same between the two arms. And the key difference is really the site of care, retaining mothers in the MCH setting for the intervention versus referring them out into general adult ART services for the control. We evaluated uh, the intervention or compared it to the control using a series of trial measurement visits that were conducted separately from routine antiretroviral therapy services in either arm. And we carried out these measurement visits at six weeks and then three, six, nine, and 12 months postpartum. We had a, a series of interview administered questionnaires. We conducted um, batch viral load testing um, we abstracted infant HIV PCR results from six to 10 weeks from routine records, as well as conducted our own um, study-specific HIV PCR testing on infants. And importantly, we abstracted data on maternal retention and care and engagement in health services from routine medical records, including clinic visits, lab testing, or pharmacy dispensing records. In analysis, the primary outcome was the combined endpoint of maternal retention in care and viral suppression, um, with viral suppression defined at 50 copies per mil. And this combined endpoint was measured at 12 months postpartum. We had a range of secondary outcomes, including virologic outcomes, as well as um, infant health outcomes. And in analysis, everything was by intention to treat. And importantly, we conducted a series of sensitivity analyses, including multivariable models, as well as multiple imputation for missing, missing outcome data. So now on to the results. Between July 2013 and December 2014, we screened 587 women and randomized 472, 238 to the control arm and 234 to the intervention, this MCH art survey. At the time of randomization, uh, the two trial arms were, were quite well balanced. Um, you can see that uh, because of changes in, in local PMTCT eligibility, about 80% of women initiated art under option B+. The median uh, time postpartum when mother-infant pairs were enrolled and randomized was five days, with at least 75% being enrolled within a week postpartum. And you can see that about three quarters of women at the time of randomization had viral loads of less than 50 copies per mil, and the vast majority of women were suppressed to less than 1,000 copies per mil at the time of randomization. So now in follow-up, by the design of the study, we referred women who were in the control arm per this local standard of care out of the MCH setting at a median of nine days postpartum. And in the intervention arm, we retained women in the MCH setting until after the end of breastfeeding and then referred them out to routine adult care. And that referral took place at a median of nine months postpartum. Our primary outcome was measured at 12 months postpartum. And you can see we had 87% of participants, or 412 of 472 with primary outcome data available. Um, the primary outcome, again, was maternal viral load measured separately from routine adult care as well as their engagement in care. And this slide is really the, the key slide for the study, and it shows the trial outcomes. You can see the primary endpoint of retention in care and viral suppression to less than 50 copies per mil at 12 months postpartum was significantly different between the intervention and the control arm. 77% of mothers in the intervention arm were suppressed and retained in care, compared to 56% of mothers in the uh, control arm, and the risk difference is 21%. These findings for the primary endpoint persisted in the component definition, so you can see there was significant improvements in retention and care, favoring the intervention arm 
over the control, as well as viral suppression measured at 50 or 1,000 copies per mil, again, favoring the intervention over the control. And in sensitivity analyses or additional analyses, these results didn't change substantially when we adjusted for uh, a range of different clinical and demographic factors between intervention and control arms, and when we imputed the missing viral load data um, that was unavailable for 13% of participants. This forest plot shows the, the same results in the shaded red box at the top, the overall intervention control difference of 21%. And what the plot shows is that this uh, intervention and control difference, that is the effect of the intervention, appeared remarkably consistent across a range of different subgroups, including PMTCT option, maternal age, as well as viral suppression at the time of randomization. We also observed that the duration of breastfeeding that was reported by mothers was significantly longer in the intervention arm compared to the control condition. So on the left-hand side, you see uh, any breastfeeding, the median duration of any breastfeeding was nine months in the intervention arm, compared to three months in the control arm. And the median duration of exclusive breastfeeding on the right-hand side was three months in the intervention arm versus 1.4 months in the control arm. And so in both instances, um, breastfeeding appeared longer by self-report in women who were retained in the MCH setting compared to those referred out. And now the final results slide. We also looked at a range of secondary outcomes uh, related to maternal as well as infant health. The cumulative risk of vertical HIV transmission through 12 months postpartum was low and didn't differ between the two arms. And we also looked at a range of different maternal and infant outcomes, um, none of which appeared significantly different between the two arms. But you can see that for many of the, the maternal and infant outcomes, the intervention favored the control or was favored over the control, um, although the, the differences didn't achieve statistical significance. And so in wrapping up, these results um, provide quite robust evidence that integrating ART services into the maternal and child health platform um, can be associated with significant improvements in postpartum maternal retention and care, viral suppression through 12 months postpartum, as well as increases in the duration of breastfeeding. And as we look for interventions to, to help support women during the postpartum period who are receiving ART, integrating ART services into the MCH setting may be a simple and highly effective strategy. Um, we're, we're looking right now at, at mechanisms that may be involved in driving this association, as well as patient-level acceptability and provider-level acceptability, as well as cost-effectiveness, and those are all very critical concerns. Um, and we're also thinking about how these results may be generalizable across diverse health systems um, and how these kinds of simple service-level interventions and models of care can be scaled up. So that's, uh, that's everything for me. I did my um, acknowledgments at the beginning. And thank Jessica very much. Thank you, Dr. Meyer. And we will again move swiftly into the next presentation by Alian Snukuzi, um, who is the a research manager at uh, MSF. And she will be presenting on HIV incidents, cascade, and testing among mothers in Western Kenya. So please bear with us as we load her presentation. So Alianz, are you with us? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Great. Over to you. Um, I think the connection is a little bit uh, slow. So everyone, we just ask for your patience um, as Alianz Nukuzi presents. Thank you. Over to you. So hmm. Jessica. Yes. Or maybe you can. 
that's okay with you. I can change. Yes, I sure. I can. I can change the slides okay. if you say yeah, when you're ready. Sure. Okay. Sorry for the uh, afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to present on behalf of the study and the rest of the students included. So I will be talking about the NIV incidents, cascade and testing among mother in Western Kenya. I have no conflict of interest to declare. So we all know that normally uh, PMTC programs using court data, but these data only gather partial information limited to those who have linked to care. Uh, the limitation of these court data avoided in country where vaccination coverage is very uh, high by surveying and test all mother infants attending clinics. Also, we know that given the increasing similarity between the PMTC, PMTCT casket and casket of care since the implementation of OpenB Plus, this type of surveillance uh, provides an, an opportunity to retain, retention of patients along the from initial diagnosis through linkage to initiation and finally viral suppression. Such studies are aimed at weak points in the casket, preventing patients from achieving undetectable viral load. Based on the last UNAID report, we know that a new HIV infection is still high in women. That's that's the need for systematic retesting in high incidence area. So the study we did was uh, carried out in Western Kenya. The national prevalence in Kenya is at 6%, but in the Western region, the prevalence can reach level as high as 27%. And PMTCT option B plus had been offered to all HIV positive women since, to, since 2014. Systematic retesting at ANC delivery as well as postnatal visit is part of the guideline. Impact evaluation survey provide information on key indicators that are needed to improve PMTCT programs. Uh, next slide. Jessica, are you with me? Yes. Okay. So the objective of this study was to estimate the incidence and prevalence among the mother attending API maternity. We also wanted to evaluate each step of the casket among HIV positive women and uh, finally to measure the ANC coverage as well as the testing and retesting coverage during pregnancy and breastfeeding period. Next slide. So the study was conducted in the Ndiwa is one of a sub county of uh, Homa Bay County, which is in the western region of Kenya. Ndiwa has a sub -pop uh, population of more than around 172,000 people. At the time of the survey, Ndiwa had 33 health facilities providing art and PMTCT service. But among all those 33 facilities, we selected 26 facilities based on the total number of the vaccination program. So this was a cross-sectional facility there. And the eligible mother was a mother of infants aged to 10 months and to 10 months. And the mother were only the mother attending PI clinics as well as giving birth in maternity. The survey was conducted from February to January 2016. Next slide. All the mothers attending the, the clinics were tested using Ditamine and then Unigold for those who were positive on Ditamine. And the positive, for the positive mother, we collected all blood on PBS card to test their viral load. And we estimated the incidence using testing history. Next slide. 
So in total, uh, we screened 3,580 women, and among them, 95.9% were included in the study. Most, the, more than half of these mothers came from the API six weeks. This is understandable because that's where the vaccination coverage is the highest. And then followed by uh, API nine months where we had another considerable number of mothers. And from the maternity, we had 536 women. Next slide. Our population was very young. The median age was 23 years, ranging from 19 to 29. Among all those mother included, 75% of them had reached primary level. Most of them resided in Diwa, 97% of them resided in Diwa. 83% were married, and 44% uh, were farmers and 88% uh, had an income less than $50 a month. Next slide. Uh, next slide. And separation testing. Jessica? Yes. This one? Next. No. I I'm on the side that says results, ANC attendance, delivery, and testing. Yes, yes, yes. that's one. Okay. So the ANC coverage was very high. 98% of women reported at least one visit within a health facility, and 90% of women had three or more ANC consultation during their last pregnancy. But so we had 48% of women who had their first NC consultation in the last semester of pregnancy. And when considering women enrolled through PI clinics only, 66% of them delivered within a health facility, while 29.7% delivered at home, and the rest delivered in other places just such as roadside. 97% of the, the women, the status during last pregnancy was ascertained for 97% of the women. Only 3.1% were not tested, and 13.8% of women were already diagnosed, and 83% of women were tested. Among the women, among the 83% of women who were tested during their last pregnancy, 17% of them had their first HIV test in the in their last trimester of pregnancy. Overall, we had 43.7% uh, of all women who were tested more than three months ago. Next slide. So when looking at the at the systematic retesting during pregnancy and breastfe breastfeeding, we have a, a, a average of 40% of women who are tested retested tested again during a ANC. Tested again, it can be tested once or twice or more than twice. So in PI nine months, we had. 48% of women who said they were tested again at ANC. Regarding testing at maternity, only 11.7% of women at API six weeks declared they have been tested at maternity, and 15% uh, of women in API nine months said they were tested at maternity. Regarding the testing at immunization, 6.9% of women in API six weeks said they have been tested at immunization, and 17.7% uh, of women said they have been tested at, immuni at immunization. Next slide. We had a total of 32 women who were newly diagnosed during the study. Of them, uh, 29 had a previous HIV test, giving an overall HIV incidence of 4.1 new cases per 100 person year. And you can see that um, 
the HIV incidence varies with age. The younger women were more likely to be new infection compared to older women. And this can also be reflected in the prevalence. The prevalence increased with age, starting for the women who are less than 19 years old to 8.1%, and the peak was reached the women aged 30 to 39 years old with a prevalence of 42.9%. Next slide. So the step of the HIV cascade of care were as follow. Out of the 35 HIV infected that were identified through the study, 97% of them had been previously diagnosed. 92.8% of them were in care, 93.4% of them ever initiated treatment, 2.6% of them uh, were on out at the time of the survey. But uh, for viral suppress suppression, we had 83.1% 83 of women who had a viral load below 1,000 copies. And when we consider women only on art, we had 87% of them were virally suppressed. On, you can also see that the younger women were, le were less performance compared to all the women. The viral load suppression in women aged less than 19 years was 61.7% compared to the 83% overall. So in conclusion, we can see um, the ANC attendance was very high as well as the testing coverage, but the systematic retesting, which is very import important in high incidence area, is not yet fully implemented in this western region of Kenya. And HIV incidence remain high in mother, especially in young mothers. The cascade of care was also good, except for the viral suppression, and they also expect for the younger women. And we also see further analysis also show that younger women were more likely to be re recently diagnosed, which can explain why the the performance in the cascade of care were, were lower compared to other group of women. Some of the recommendation is to invest to more efforts are important to diagnose and treat HIV positive men and prevent young women from being infected. The strength of this study is that uh, this study is representative of a group of mother who attends API clinics especially the group of children, of mother of children attending the six weeks vaccination, that's the Penta vaccine. And we also have the high inclusion rate, but unfortunately all our data on the, re, on the treatment were self-reported. So I would like to acknowledge all the study team as well as the partner who have supported the study. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Allianz. Um, and we'll open it up for questions. I'll go back to the first one that we received uh, a while ago after Dr. Zash's presentation, which was more of a clarification about uh, whether uh, dulategravir-based regimens were being used for PMTCT in Botswana and given to all mothers. So Dr. Zash, would you like to respond to that? Hello? Dr. Zash, are you with us? Oh, it sounds like she's not a, she's not able to hear, okay, but I wonder if we're going to type uh, a message to her and maybe in the meantime okay. move to the next question. Yes. Um, so the next question is, next few questions are for Dr. Meyer. 
Uh, were you able to consider women who were already on ART at conception who were refer for, ah, excuse me who were referred into MCH by their clinic provider then back to their original clinic provider? So that's the first question. And the second is, how did you define retention and care at 12 months? Was it a single visit or were multiple visits required? And then um, the third one for Dr. Meyer is, the duration of breastfeeding seems quite low. What is the background breastfeeding duration in Cape Town or South Africa? Did you do anything to ensure a successful referral in the control arm? So, Dr. Meyer, would you like Thanks. to take those? Thanks, Jessica. I'm going to forget them. Okay. Um, and so you'll remind me. I'll yes. start with Dorothy's questions, uh, questions first. Um, the, the duration of breastfeeding, Dorothy, for this setting um, is, is in the control arm relatively normal. That, uh, this is not a, um, a, a setting in sort of in terms of urban South Africa um, where there's very, very long durations of breastfeeding. So the, the control duration of breastfeeding is, is, we think, somewhat normative for this particular part of South Africa. Um, but I recognize that compared to uh, durations of breastfeeding in other countries and p possibly other parts of South Africa, it's relatively, relatively short. Um, the second question was about supporting the referral out. We had done a little bit of work on, on transfers of women out of, out of the ANC um, during the postpartum period before, and so what we used was the local standard of care, which was a, a, a set of counseling around being transferred out and about the importance of completing the transfer, about the importance of adherence during the transfer, um, about making, making a clinical connection on the, on the other side of the transfer, and a, a detailed referral letter and an explanation of the content of the referral letter to the mother. Um, but all of it was in the context of sort of optimized local standard of care. There was no special transfer or referral intervention as part of this. Um, some of the other questions, and Jessica, you'll remind me mm -hmm. if I forget. Um, uh, it, women on what I would refer to as chronic ART before pregnancy entering antenatal care, um, they were not the focus of this of this intervention study, uh, but they, I agree with the the commenter um, wholly that they're a very important population, um, but we didn't study them uh, in in this trial. Um, they would have been excluded from this trial, um, but but certainly a very important population. Um, and Jessica, the, now I yeah, forgotten. the third is uh, the definition of retention that you used. Oh, at, the definition of retention. At Twelve yeah. months, and was it a single visit or multiple visits? Yeah. So we used we examined a wide range of definitions because the definition is, as the questioner is alluding to, quite important. Um, and we found consistent results across uh, whatever definitions we chose. For these purposes, we defined engaged at twelve months as a visit between nine and fifteen months postpartum. Uh, so in the six month window around twelve months postpartum. Um, if, a, if a woman had a documented HIV care um, engagement, uh, be that represented by dispensing in the pharmacy or laboratory test related HIV or a clinical visit recorded, we would have called her engaged in care or retained. Okay, great. And I think there's one last question for you, which was, did you check how much um, integration was impacting the quality of MCH services? And also, did you compare any or see any significant differences in the MTCT transmission rates postnatally? Yeah. So we, um, regarding postnatal transmission rates, um, I, I had it on one of the slides. We found very low levels of transmission postnatally. The overall MTCT was less than 1% at 12 months postpartum, um, which is quite good. But we were very underpowered as a result to detect any differences, and so no, we didn't see any significant differences between the two, noting that overall transmission was very low. The, the second question was about quality of care. We didn't have quality of care um, markers directly, but we did spend a fair bit of time investigating patient-provider relationships, which is one component of quality of care, of course, and we're in the process of, of examining that right now. Um, but one of the one of our preliminary findings that we think will bear out is that patient provider relationships appeared stronger in the integrated setting um, compared to the general adult ART setting for these postpartum women. Okay. Um, and another two more questions, so bear with us and then we'll move on to questions for uh, 
Alliance and the presentation on retesting um, pregnant women. So the last two questions are, what was the acceptability of healthcare providers to integrate ART into MCH? And did you look at that? And was there a difference in the rates of HIV exposed infants being tested at nine months or cessation of breastfeeding? Jessica, could you say the second question again, please? I just I lost. Was there a, a difference in the rates of HIV exposed infants being retested at nine months or at the cessation um, of breastfeeding? I see. So uh, regarding that, we did not look at that. We know that that uptake of six to ten week EID was slightly higher in, among infants in the intervention arm compared to uh, the control arm. Um, noting the background EID uptake in this setting is quite high, but we haven't looked at the cessation of breastfeeding testing. Um, and that's a, that's a very nice point and something we will certainly take uh, into consideration. And um, my memory is shocking, Jessica. The uh, oh, acceptability, acceptability yes. of um, providers. So we, we didn't quantitatively uh, assess it, but we know from sort of process measures um, that there was an increase in in provider um, and the requirements on providers, and uh, and that that particular aspect of the sort of increased workload uh, was a concern that was raised. Um, but that but we don't have formal measures of provider level acceptability other than sort of qualitative ones now. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so we have two questions for Allianz, which is, are you considering PrEP for discordant couples to prevent HIV in women testing HIV negative, considering that adherence is high? So that is the first one, which is regarding PrEP. Um, and then there's a, there was a follow-up question. Um, I'm trying to find it. Uh, but if you want to take that one on, um, feel free. The second is, what was the response of women to retesting and the response of providers? Was there any resistance or hesitation? So the first one is related to providing PrEP to women who are HIV negative, uh, pregnant women who are HIV negative, and then the uh, acceptability of women to retest as well as providers. Thank you, Jessica. Mm -hmm. Yes, regarding the question on PrEP, this is one of the recommendations we've also made, and right now we are still in the dissemination of the results, and we are discussing with our partners as well as the Ministry of Health to see what to do about this high incidence in women. But PrEP is really one of a strong option we've recommended. And then regarding the acceptability of testing, so as part of as part of the, the acceptability was very we asked more than three thousand four hundred women who were included in the study only had twenty refusal. So this was very high, and there was a, a qualitative study aside. The results are not here. But based on the talk we had with who the acceptability of everything was more likely to be high and had a strong objection to it. Healthcare providers as well did not have a strong objection to uh, retesting. Uh, we didn't do a testing because the tested men were coming at the API clinics. So what provide uh, an answer to that okay. about the rates of zero right. disturbance? Okay, great. So it, it was a little hard uh, to hear. So I'll recap, and uh, you can correct me if I'm if I misrepresent what you said uh, via the chat because you were breaking up a little bit. But I think that you said that of prep is definitely uh, an option for. Um, pregnant women who are HIV negative, um, though I, it sounds like that wasn't a really explored or, or the focus of the study, and that there were uh, high rates of acceptability uh, for providers and, and women, um, and that there, there was not any partner testing done as part of the study. So you can't respond to the question about the rate of serodiscordance. But if uh, I've 
heard wrong, please feel free to type in and, and respond to those questions. Um, so thank you for our first uh, group of presenters uh, for joining us and um, and for the lively Q&A. And we'll move from and shift from a focus on PMTCT to uh, pediatric treatment and turn it over to Dr. Ilesh Jani, who's the general director of the Instituto Nacional de Saúde, which is the equivalent of a National Institute of Health at Mozambique's Ministry of Health. And he will present on the effect of point of care testing on antiretroviral therapy initiation rates in infants. Without further ado, we'll turn it over to you, Dr. Jani. Dr. Johnny, are you there? Hmm. Okay. Hello? Yes, there you are. Yes, okay. Thank you, Jessica. So, um, I can't, see, yeah, the slides are back. Yes. Okay. Can you see the slides? Okay. So, yeah. okay. Yes, I can. Thank you. So, um, lab capacity for early infant diagnosis has been expanding in, in the last decade or so, but uh, health systems in general in sub-Saharan Africa are struggling with uh, mainly with long test turnaround times. And um, a recent evaluation has shown that only about 51% of infants born to women living with HIV received a virological test within the first two months of life. And um, to some extent, these diagnostic delays uh, are causing high rates of loss to follow up of infants before ART is initiated and may be contributing to HIV related infant mortality. So if you see the graph on the right slide, right side of the slide, you can see that uh, there is an early peak of mortality uh, around two, three months of life and, and the current delays may, uh, may, um, you know, deliver results to caregivers after this mortality peak. So we may be losing significant amount of children during that mortality peak. So, uh, it is urgent that we find ways of delivering results faster to, to caregivers. So, uh, the World Health Organization uh, has recently pre-qualified two point-of-care technologies for early infant diagnosis. And these uh, point-of-care technologies have been shown to have uh, good performance in the hands of non-laboratory staff in primary health care um, uh, clinics. So what uh, we did was to... Uh, do a two-arm cluster randomized trial in 16 primary health care clinics in, in Mozambique. And uh, one of the arms, the intervention arm, uh, had eight clinics in it, and they implemented a point-of-care technology uh, for uh, diagnosis of HIV in infants, while in the control arm, uh, we did what the health system is doing, which is to collect the collecting uh, dry blood spots for testing at the reference laboratories uh, throughout the country. Uh, the study uh, took place in 2015-2016, and uh, the point-of-care testing uh, in the intervention arm uh, was done by nurses uh, using whole blood uh, collected from infants that came to the health facility between four and six weeks of, of age. Um, the primary outcomes of our study uh, were the proportion of HIV-positive infants initiating treatment within two months of uh, specimen collection. Uh, and uh, the other primary outcome was the proportion of HIV-positive infants who initiated therapy and that were retained in care at three months of follow-up. So here in this slide, you can see the study flow chart. So the uh, upper part of the slide uh, describes what happened in intervention arm and then the lower part what happened in the, in the control arm. Uh, 
standard of care. So I will describe first what happened in the, the standard of care arm, the lower part of the slide. You can see that there were uh, nine, uh, 1,904 eligible patients, of which uh, eight, 1,876 were included. Of these, 1,532 results were available at the health facility, of which 102 were positive uh, results. Uh, 1,231 results were received by the caregiver, of which 64 were HIV positive results. Uh, 49 HIV positive uh, infants were initiated uh, on ART, uh, and 21 patients were retained at three months uh, post ART initiation. On the intervention arm in the upper half of the slide, uh, you can see that we had 2,054 eligible patients. Uh, 2,034 were included in the study. 2,034 results were available at the health facility, of which 175 were HIV positive. Uh, 2,026 results were received by the caregiver, of which 174 were HIV positive. We had 164 HIV positive patients initiating ART, and of these 101 patients were retained in care three months after ART initiation. Uh, this slide shows uh, the characteristics of the patients. So uh, around uh, close to half of the patients were female. Uh, around two-thirds uh, had less than two months of age. 92.1% uh, of the women were taking ART, and 92.6% of the infants were taking nevirapine for prophylaxis. Uh, at the end, we had, uh, in total, 7.8% of the infants who turned out to be HIV uh, positive. So this slide shows uh, the primary outcomes of the study. Uh, you, you can see the red boxes around the, the, the two primary outcomes. Um, so within two months of sample collection, we had uh, on the point, in the point of care arm, 89.7% uh, of infants initiating therapy uh, in comparison with only 12.8% in the standard of care arm. Uh, these differences became uh, smaller as time uh, uh, went, but you can see that at six months uh, after sample collection, still only 40.2% of children in the standard of care arm had initiated ART. Uh, the retention rate was also significantly different between the two arms. Uh, it was at three months, 61.6% .6 of infants in the point of care arm had, uh, were retained in care when compared to 42.9% in the standard of care arm. Please note that it's still uh, only 61.6% of the infants in the point of care arm were retained, so we still lost to follow up about uh, close to 40% of infants, even in the point of care arm. Um, results were received by patients uh, on the same day of sample collection in 98.2% of children in the point of care arm versus uh, no one in the standard of care. Uh, within two months of sample collection, uh, it was 7.2% in the standard of care arm, and within six months of sample collection, still uh, less than half of patients in the standard of care arm had received their results. Um, this table then shows uh, uh, some uh, data on age and time between steps along the, the care cascade. So the age at sample collection was uh, 40 days 
uh, for point of care and 33 for the standard of care arm. The age that the results received was 41 days for point of care and 172 days for the standard of care arm. You can see that a long time elapsed between uh, collection and, and the reception of, of results. The age at ART initiation was 127 days in the point of care arm uh, against 202 days in the standard of care arm. Uh, please note that uh, you know, it's still we, uh, even with point of care testing, we initiated ART uh, in, in, in kids that had 127 days median age. Time between sample collection results received was zero days for point of care, 125 days for standard of care. This uh, slide shows a Kaplan-Meier estimate of time from sample collection to initiation of antiretroviral therapy, and in median was zero days for point of care, and the median for the standard of care arm was 127 days. Uh, so, uh, in conclusion, uh, point of care early infant diagnosis significantly reduced infant loss to follow up across the cascade of care and enabled earlier and increased ART initiation. Uh, decentralization of early infant diagnosis using point of care testing uh, coupled to additional interventions may considerably contribute to achieving global pediatric ART targets. Uh, deployment of point of care early infant testing should be accompanied with other investments in, in health systems. Uh, I just would like to state that point of care testing is not a silver bullet that is going to resolve all the issues of the health system. So it is an important tool that, that can help us, but it, it needs to be coupled with, with, uh, overall investments in health systems. Uh, um, and um, there are several limitations in our uh, study, uh, but uh, I think some important ones is that um, we did not uh, investigate uh, the, out the effect of point of care early infant diagnosis on, on other patient important outcomes, such as long-term uh, retention in care or mortality. So these are questions that uh, remain to be uh, investigated. Uh, so just before I, I, I conclude, I uh, wanted to, to say that um, in Mozambique we have uh, started with a national scale-up of point-of-care testing uh, in, in a network that, that still uh, will do laboratory testing, so it's both types of testing uh, are coexisting in our network. So we have started scale up in January 2017, uh, and our plan for now uh, is anticipating that by 2018 we will have around 130 sites that that will have point of care testing installed. So and we are uh, really going for true point of care placement on the nurse's desk, not in in the lab. And um, we are working with a, on a prioritization matrix uh, to select sites that, that will have point of care testing. And this matrix considers various aspects like logistics and disease burden and, and, and uh, the uh, volume of testing at site, um, et cetera. And, and finally, that, that we are also working with sites uh, to conduct some patient flow adjustments within the site so that uh, we assure uh, some uh, better linkage to care um, uh, after point of care testing is, is deployed at, at the site. So we would like to acknowledge study participants and their families, the staff at all study sites in our labs, and our generous funders. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Jani, and we will um proceed to the next presentation and then break for questions. We've noticed, noted the questions that you've submitted and we will return to them after our uh, next presenter finishes his presentation. 
So as we're loading the presentation, I'd like to introduce Dr. Mohendran Arshari, who is a pediatric infectious disease specialist at the University of KwaZulu-Natal and the King Edward VIII Hospital in South Africa. And he will present on HIV-infected children with severe acute malnutrition, early or delayed ART initiation. Hey, thank you very much, Jessica. So, let's go to the front. Um, so, I think it's just it's, it's the other extreme of what's been presented before. Um, and certainly, while we'd want to prevent antidote, uh, children from becoming infected and diagnosing them early, unfortunately, we're still having a lot of children who still fall between the track, uh, the tracks, and they present with a delayed uh, presentation and more severe advanced. Uh, form of HIV disease. And often what we find in, our, in terms of our clinical practice is that these children's first um, entry into the healthcare system is with severe acute malnutrition. So the, uh, the study itself, um, so we know that um, HIV infection and severe acute malnutrition represents a, a completely distinct clinical entity. Um, and it's related to these physiological changes occur, uh, that uh, associated with both malnutrition and HIV. There's increased energy expendi expenditure with an increased basal metabolic rate, higher rates of cold infections, diarrhea and malabsorption, and also micronutrient deficiencies and, and higher rates of food insecurity and poverty in these uh, patients' lives. And the management of these children with uh, malnutrition and HIV is further complicated by the gastrointestinal side effects of antiretroviral treatments and the metabolic uh, aberrations that occur with these children. And the, also the unexplored uh, aspects of the altered pharmacokinetics of not only antiretroviral drugs, but uh, the, the common antibiotics that we use in these malnourished children. And we do know from multiple studies that despite nutritional rehabilitation, uh, that children with uh, severe acute malnutrition who are HIV infected without antiretroviral treatment, despite nutritional rehabilitation, their seizure counts continue to decline. Um, and they have a much higher rate of mortality compared to their non-infected uh, 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 counterparts. And uh, from multiple studies, uh, severe acute malnutrition have been found to be an independent predictor of mortality, even with appropriate immunological and biological responses in these uh, children. Um, so with that, the, the WHO Nutritional Guideline Advisory Group had, had identified determining the optimal timing of antiretroviral treatment initiation and also the antiretroviral treatment doses uh, in these children as a key area of uh, need for research. So the study premise itself was to look in to see whether uh, the timing of antiretroviral treatment either during the acute phase of malnutrition or waiting until some degree of nutritional rehabilitation occurred before starting antiretroviral treatment uh, made a difference uh, in terms of outcomes. Um, so we compared the nutritional, uh, immunological, biological responses to antiretroviral treatment at 48 weeks um, in HIV-infected uh, malnourished children, and they were randomized to either immediate antiretroviral treatment, which was defined as starting treatment within 14 days of admission, versus children who had their antiretroviral treatment delayed until the severe malnutrition is resolved, and they were defined as either initiating treatment after nutritional recovery, and we defined that as having a increase in the weight for height Z score by um, one standard deviation or with a resolution of the edema and return of the, uh, the appetite and after two weeks following admission. Um, so the, the study itself was conducted at King Edward Hospital, which is based in KwaZulu-Natal, which has a quite a high HIV prevalence rate, and it uh, was done at a tertiary facility in, in Durban, uh, King Edward VIII uh, Hospital. So a key uh, inclusion criteria was uh, the children had to be uh, severely malnourished, as defined by the WHO uh, the definition, 
which was based on a weight for height, sales score of minus three, middle arm circumference, abnormality, and, and, and nutritional fetal edema. And they had to be HIV uh, infected as per the South African guideline. Uh, so these children were either then randomized to uh, start treatment at these various times, and they, uh, however, the uh, management uh, in terms of their malnutrition was as per the WHO in patient management of uh, SAM protocol. Um, and patients were started on the back of a lamivudine and, and dupinavir, ritonavir, if they were less than three years of age, or a back of a lamivudine and a favrams if they were over three years of age and over 10 kilograms, sorry. And all doses were prescribed as per the weight banded doses uh, that was based on the WHO weight band dosing chart. So we followed these children up uh, at baseline two weeks, four weeks, eight weeks, 12 weeks, 24 and 48 weeks. And they had a nutritional assessment with a history and examination. And they had uh, bloods done for CD front viral load and safety bloods. So in total, we had 83 patients who were enrolled. Uh, we had one screening failure, as a, which was a false positive uh, uh, initial test. And then 40 patients were enrolled into the early arm, and 42 patients were, were enrolled into the delayed arm. Um, and in the early arm, we had six deaths, and we had seven lost less, less to follow up, and that left 27 patients uh, that that completed the 48-week follow-up period. And in the delayed arm, we had eight deaths and three follow-ups uh, with a, uh, 31 patients who were ev uh, evaluated at 48 weeks. Um, in terms of the baseline characteristics, um, the, the, most of the baseline characteristics were, were the same. Majority of the children were around 20, 20, uh, 1 to 25 uh, months. Uh, the time to ART initiation was significantly different between the two arms. Uh, was 5.6 days in the early arm and 23 days in the in the delayed arm. In terms of uh, uh, looking at the mortality between the two arms, at, at 48 weeks, uh, 14 patients had demise, which gave us a 17% uh, mortality rate. Uh, six in the early arm and eight in the delayed arm. Uh, there was no significant difference in terms of mortality between the, the two arms. The average time to, from enrollment to death was uh, 74 days, uh, with a standard deviation, deviation of around 60 days. Um, but the mean time to, uh, to death was, um, uh, was 92 days in the early arm compared to 60 days in the delayed arm. Uh, but no patients had demise prior to antiretroviral treatment initiation. Um, of note, a majority of the deaths occurred within uh, the first 12 weeks of uh, ART initiation. And that seems to be the danger period in terms of these children's uh, recovery. Looking at the CD4 counts, um, if you look at the, the change in terms of the, the CD4 counts over time, uh, there was a significant improvement in terms of the CD4 count uh, from ART initiation to 48 weeks. Um, however, when we compared the two arms, although there was a slight difference in terms of uh, favoring the delayed arm, that was not st uh, statistically significant. Again, when we looked at the uh, change in CD4 count using a multiple mixed effects linear regression model, uh, there again was uh, uh, no significant, uh, statistically significant difference in immune recovery between the two groups. Looking at the viral load, um, at uh, 24 weeks, we had 67% of the patients um, received the protocol defined uh, a biological response, which was a viral load less than 1,000 copies per mole, uh, which was 15, about 60% in the early arm and 75% in the delayed arm. Um, however, because of the numbers, this was not statistically significant. Uh, by 48 weeks, the numbers, uh, uh, we had 81% of the patients had biological, uh, de protocol defined biological response, which was 77% in the early arm and 84% in the delayed arm. However, this again was, although there was a, uh, a difference, it was not statistically significant. Uh, when looking at the mixed, uh, effects linear regression model, the, in terms of evaluating, um, 
the, the viral endpoints and the change in viral load, they, it favored the delayed arm at both uh, first, uh, 24 weeks and 48 weeks. In terms of the anthropometric uh, responses, at 48 weeks, 76.6% uh, of uh, patients achieved adequate antibiotic responses, which was defined as a weight for height score of over uh, minus one Z score. Uh, with similar responses in both arms, 77% in the early arm and 76.6% in the delayed arm, which was not uh, significant. Um, again, when we adjusted it for various parameters, there was no, uh, it, it did not change the statistical significance. Uh, we found no statistical significance in terms of the BAMI and the weight for Z score. However, what we did find was in terms of your height for age score, there was a statistical significance in terms of the uh, change in, in height uh, for children um, uh, in the delayed arm compared to the early arm. Um, so there's, there's quite a few limitations in terms of the study. I mean, this was a single site, uh, and it was performed in a, a tertiary uh, level setting. Um, our limited numbers, the, the study was powered to look for uh, a significant change in terms of the weight for height, uh, uh, the, uh, the anthropomorphic responses between the two arms, which it did not find, and it wasn't powered to detect a, a smaller differences in terms of the biological and um, height for age changes that we did see. Um, and again, just to reiterate, this is limited to uh, malnourished children who require admission, which is a, a completely different uh, type of patient compared to your standard malnourished uh, ch uh, uh, child. Um, and these, these kids tend to be much more sicker with many more opportunistic infections. So in summary, um, so HIV-infected children in, admitted with SAM initiated on antiretroviral treatment demonstrate significant improvements in their CD4 counts and antibiotic parameters, together with significant biological reductions compared to baseline. And in this randomized control trial, comparing this early versus delayed antiretroviral treatment initiation, um, although the differences in your CD4 count and biological suppression and chronic responses at 48 weeks were not significant, the changes in uh, CD4 viral load and weight for age uh, Z score and height for age Z score occurred earlier and favored the delay down. And based on these results, um, our suggestion would be that uh, children, uh, severely malnourished children with severe disease uh, who need to start antiretroviral treatment should delay um, antiretroviral treatment uh, for at least two weeks while you're starting off uh, nutritional rehabilitation and start antiretroviral treatment once the nutritional uh, 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 responses have occurred. Um, so just want to acknowledge uh, the, the, our funders and also the team that was involved in the study and uh, the patients and participants who uh, participated in the study. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Arshari. And we'll break now for a quick uh, Q&A. There were a number of questions for Dr. Johnny, and I'll begin with one of the earlier ones, which may not be on the screen, but it was sent in by Maria, who asked, why only three months post-ART initiation um, defined as remaining in care? Why was that definition used as remaining in care. And then some of the others, we'll take two more, is how would you explain the difference in ART initiation between the two arms after receiving results by the patient or caregiver? And linked to that, what is the role of loss to follow up or mortality? And then what are the barriers to starting ART despite the earlier diagnosis with point of care? So, Dr. Johnny, okay. are you able yeah, to take those questions? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So, the first one, yeah, why like only three, three months? months? Yeah. I, mean, I mean, we would love to have followed uh, up for longer, but um, we, um, we had funding issues, and, and we could only follow up for three months. So, I, I think that's one of the limitations of, of the study that, that I have pointed out before. 
So I completely agree. It would have been really nice to follow up for longer. Um, then, um, why uh, the difference in the RT initiation between the two arms after results were received? Well, I don't really know. I can only speculate. Uh, my bet would be that either this is due to mortality or uh, because um, the point of care testing, uh, because it is predictable and it provides a better quality of service to the patient, that because of that we have uh, a result in, in increasing retention. Uh, even after the results is given back. I mean, with the current standard of care, people don't really know when the result is coming back. Sometimes it requires repeated visits to the health facility, and eventually patients lose confidence in the system, and, and that really aggravates loss to follow up. Now, the, as uh, for the third question, uh, the barriers to starting ART, um, despite earlier diagnosis. And in this study, we saw that close to 10% of uh, patients in the point of care, 10% of patients in the point of care uh, arm did not initiate uh, ART within two months. Uh, my, my guess, again, is that uh, it's probably due to either uh, mortality or because the families uh, the, uh, could not accept the results and decided not to come back to the to the health facility but it's it's again it's, it's speculation i don't really know okay thank you so much for those uh, clarifications and a couple more and i've batched them together uh, a few are around uh, the actual implementation and do nurses provide POC? I believe that you indicated that they do. And yes. are there any other cotters that are providing POC testing? What is the cost, the average cost per uh, POC test for children? And what were the platforms that were used? Yeah, so we, we have been working with nurses doing the testing. Um, and um, the platform that we use in this study is the ALIR-Q. It's one of the two platforms that has been pre-qualified by WHO. The other is the CEFAID uh, platform, but the one we used was the ALIR-Q. Uh, and uh, as for the cost, there may be better people to, to uh, talk about cost of, of the, the testing, but uh, I, I think it's, it's around $20 per patient. Okay. Great. Thank you so much. And uh, a question for Dr. Arshari. Were you able to look at the comorbidities in those infants who died? Dr. Arshari, I think you're on mute, so I'll unmute you. So I'll repeat, Dr. Arshari, are you with us? Hi. Yes, okay. I think you can be here. Yeah. Um, so we looked at, uh, so the other main things that we looked at was iris uh, phenomenon. So we looked at uh, both TB iris, BCG iris, and other uh, fungal iris uh, responses. Um, and uh, uh, there was no difference in terms of the, uh, well, there were no significant, uh, statistically significant differences in terms of iris responses between these these two patients. The commonest iris uh, reaction that we got in terms of our patients overall was uh, BCG iris, um, and then second was, was TB iris, was also uh, extremely common. Uh, majority of the deaths that occurred were uh, due to bacterial infections, uh, was, was predominant, and then the, the others were either pneumonia or gastroenteritis. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Arshari and Dr. Johnny. I know that um, you have very busy schedules, um, so if you would like to uh, leave us now, um, feel free to do that. And we extend our 
thanks and appreciation to all of the presenters and researchers who shared their findings with us uh, today. Um, and we will also now move on to a broader summary of PMTCT early infant diagnosis and pediatric treatment abstracts, which again, as I mentioned, was uh, prepared with the support of Dr. Lynn Moffison of EGPATH. And the presentation will be given by uh, Dr. Nandita Sugandi, who is a clinical advisor for the Clinton Health Access Initiative or CHAI as uh, the organization is commonly uh, known as. Um, and she will take us through some of the other abstracts that were presented at CROI that are relevant and pertinent to our, our work. So thank you again to all of our presenters for your time. And uh, thank you to our audience for your attention. And we'll uh, continue with a very brief presentation on some other abstracts of interest. Thanks so much, Jessica. And I've just um, taken over the presentation so I can advance to the slides. But uh, and again, I also wanted to say thank you to our presenters. We had a really great discussion um, of, of those uh, very key abstracts that were presented at the conference. Uh, and overall, I think just very quickly, uh, we wanted to go through a few more. I think the theme that's sort of been emerging is that in, in getting to 90, 90, 90 for, for pregnant women and for children, we need a little bit more of a, a different approach we need to better understand what's happening and so i think we with an eye to sort of that um sort of that sort of thinking we we selected a handful of additional um abstracts and some of the present or some of the the authors are actually on the call and so if i misrepresent something please stop me or speak up um and we will be circulating all of these um these slides, so I'm going to go through very quickly uh, as we're already sort of running over time, um, but but please feel free to, to share any thoughts or or reach out to the, the presenters or the, um, you know, after the call. So we're going to start with um, some of the pregnancy and PMTCT uh, abstracts that, that were put together. One is uh, one about HIV retesting in pregnancies and, and missed opportunities. So this was actually uh, an analysis of, uh, done in Kenya um, looking at the number of women who um, who were retested in pregnancy, uh, uh, be, you know, if, especially if they had presented and tested early on. And I, I think this was a question early on about how retesting was accepted in, in Kenya. And I believe it's in the guidelines itself um, that women who are pregnant uh, should be tested three months after their first negative test. And so when you sort of looked at the, the results here, and it's a little difficult to see the, the the graphic, but it actually was really sort of surprising that even though uh, the majority of women, more than 90 percent, presented at less than 28 weeks gestation, um, and those were all women that should have been retested prior to delivery, uh, at, at delivery more than half actually sort of had uh, an un almost an unknown status given that they had not been retested. Um, and of those that had been retested, uh, two were positive. So that was sort of a zero conversion rate of 1.5%. And again, this is just within this group. Um, but if we sort of extrapolate, that suggests that we've missed about 19 cases of incident HIV infection. So I think this, uh, this sort of highlights the need for focusing on retesting in, in women. Um, another was uh, the uptake and retention in pregnant women starting option B plus in uh, Maputo. And uh, really quickly, I just want to mention that in, in this study, one of the outcomes was that um, women starting in B plus had, uh, had worse retention than women who were starting uh, who were non-pregnant, um, and this was particularly the case for women for the younger age group, so the 15 to 19 and 20 to 19. So I think with our interest in adolescents um, and, and, and young people, uh, I think this is an important thing for us to, to realize is that retention for, you know, whether it's a comparison of, of pregnant women versus non-pregnant women, but that those younger age groups are really critical um, to, to understand what's happening. Um, there was another about there was another uh, modeling uh, study that was presented about the optimal time to obtain viral load testing during pregnancy in order to predict uh, who is going to have a viral load under a thousand by the time of delivery. So really being able to figure out who are those high risk infants. Um, 
at higher risk for HIV infection. And this was a, mo a model that was built um, and Essentially, you know, what we are, we currently have is the WHO recommendations for viral load monitoring that, um, recommend, uh, viral load testing six months after initiation and then six months again and then 12 months after that. And if we are sort of looking at different scenarios for when women start, um, when women, you know, women who lose control of their of the virus after suppre initial suppression, um, that we're really with this algorithm missing um, a great deal, uh, a great number of, of sort of high risk uh, uh, pregnancies around the time of delivery. And so this again, I think, is is highlighting the need to look more carefully at what uh, kind of viral load uh, algorithms we should be using for pregnant women if we need to do something differently. Um, there was also a follow-up um, on subsequent pregnancies in the PROMISE trial, and I think as we, again, we have um, more data, we need to look more carefully at, at what are the, the uh, different options and outcomes for women based on the, the, the regimens that they're on, um, and in this uh, longer-term uh, sort of look at subsequent pregnancies, they found that there were, for those women that were, uh, that remained on ART, uh, after after pregnancy, that there were higher rates of abortion and, and, and stillbirths with with those women as a, opposed to those that had um, uh, deferred ART or stopped ART after after pregnancy and then restarted again. Um, there was also a, a, a sort of look at from a uh, from the UK uh, a, a comparison of women that were started on uh, PI based ART. Uh, versus NNRTI, and what was found here is that women who are on lopinavir, ritonavir-based regimens at conception have higher rates of preterm delivery compared to those that were on an NNRTI or an, uh, another boosted PI uh, regimen. Uh, and just moving on to infant HIV diagnosis, again, this is another area that, that this group has been very focused in, in on. Um, and, you know, we've been talking a lot about point of care. There was another abstract that was presented on the use of point of care for both maternal and infant testing um, in Tanzania and in Bay of Tanzania. And it was looking at the operational specificity, sensitivity, and predictive value of a qualitative and quantitative uh, point of care test that was performed by nurses, uh, and as well as assessing vertical uh, transmission rates and risk factors. And so here they found that there was a good correlation between uh, conventional testing and the point of care that was used, uh, and that um, you know a, a great you know a number of sort of intra, in, in utero infections were picked up. Um, uh, with these with these children, and as well as with mothers, it was it was uh, easier to uh, identify uh, who was uh, at higher risk uh, when point of care was used uh, before delivery. Um, this was also an, another <coughs> uh, abstract from Botswana that looked at tar targeted HIV screening at birth um, in order to identify those that may be at high risk, and so this was. Um, looking at uh, infants who were born HIV positive, and when they looked back, they actually found that all the pa uh, the 12 patients that, or the 12 infants that were positive, had actually could have been identified as high risk at the time of screening. So without a viral load, but um, in the mom, but just by asking if mom had had eight weeks, at least eight weeks of maternal ART or um, a uh, viral load suppression. Uh, one major area of concern with birth PCR has been on the longer-term retention and care, and I think there's been some uh, some concern expressed about this, and this was a somewhat more reassuring uh, evidence from South Africa uh, that in those uh, infants, they, they compared sort of the control group, which was a, a historical um, uh, cohort, compared to uh, infants who had birth testing, uh, conventional birth testing versus point-of-care birth testing, and they found that actually with both the conventional and point-of-care birth testing, there was better retention um, for the 6- to 10-week PCR uh, and that may be, you know, that, you know, one of the, the, the reasons for that may also be the additional counseling that was done. Um, but again, this is, this has been an area of, 
of, of, of concern and debate of whether or not we will lose our, our you know, opportunity for six to ten week testing if, if kids are being tested at birth. Um, there's also, uh, there was a study from Thailand looking at uh, the potential delay in PCR detection if, if infants receive combination ART prophylaxis. So in, in Thailand, those women who uh, are at high risk, those infants receive um, AZT, 3TC, and nevirapine as prophylaxis for six weeks. And they looked at the number of HIV, and there were 95 HIV-infected infants in this group, um, and uh, 73 of them were identified as high risk, but only uh, only 17 were actually diagnosed at birth. And I think this raises some questions about when infection is actually happening. Is it happening? Uh, is it an intrapartum uh, infection, or is it uh, is it really rel you know sort of due to the the uh, ARVs that that the infant is exposed to? Uh, so I think this is one area of of, of further research that's needed. And then moving into pediatric treatment, um, there's, you know, again, with the um, with the, the introduction of birth testing, there's been more discussion about the safety of, of uh, using triple, uh, you know, triple drug regimens in neonates. And so this was looking at prof triple ARV prophylaxis and high-risk HIV-exposed infants, and the dosing is slightly different. But when you look at the dosing that was used, um, it was the, the nevirapine plasma levels um, stayed above the well above the prophylaxis target, and it, in most cases, actually um, sort of uh, met the therapeutic targets uh, and appeared to be safe um, and maintained for the first first, first four weeks of life. Um, we also heard a little bit more about treatment of acute infections in neonates. Um, these were infants that were started, uh, 30 infants were started um, uh, ART at 48 hours of birth um, and, and started with a nevirapine-based regimen and then changed to lopinavir-ritonavir. Um, and there was some variability in the ART response. So even though we started early, um, only about a third attained and sustained undetectable uh, uh, um, viral load suppression. Um, and three of those actually became DNA PCR negative at, at further follow up, but there were still a number of patients that uh, did not achieve viral su suppression at the endpoint. And I think we need to again better understand um, what are the you know uh, how do we how do we use uh, birth testing and early infant treatment um, more successfully in these in these infants. Um, and a couple more uh, as well with sort of the predictors of switch to second line in, in children. So this was uh, part of the Cypher collaboration, so looked at data on almost 10,000 children. Um, and uh, interestingly enough, about two-thirds of them were under the age of five at the start of ART. Um, and uh, most children were started on NNRTI-based regimens, uh, the medium child follow-up for the children were 27 months, but uh, we actually lost about 20% of them uh, were lost to follow-up, 20% sort of transferred out, uh, and about uh, almost 4,000 switched to second line, so it's a rate of 14.6 per 1,000 patients switching to second line per year, but the median time to switch was about 25 months at an age of 8.6 years. Um, and so there was a lot of variation across the countries, but I think this sort of points to um, the delayed detection of failure in in um, in, in, in our pediatric patients. Uh, but some of the factors that were associated with a more rapid time to switch were uh, male sex, older age, earlier um, year of ART start, uh, and using NNRTI at first line, uh, having viral load monitoring, and those patients that are in upper or upper middle income countries. Um, Second to last, there was um, a also an, an abstract presented on um, super boosting with rifampicin that looked at sort of the PK when when you provide one-to-one uh, -one dosing with lopinavir and ritonavir um, that was well tolerated and maintained adequate levels uh, for viral suppression. So that was sort of uh, reassuring and 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 uh, supports the WHO recommendation to super boost lopinavir and ritonavir uh, during during TB treatment. Uh, there was also an abstract presented on uh, dolutegravir PK in younger children. So as the adult world is moving towards dolutegravir use, 
Um, we are, are, you know, the evidence is accumulating for use in children, so we hope to find uh, a pr an approval for younger children uh, in the next, you know, shortly. And lastly, this was a long-term uh, follow-up on for the breather trial for those weekends off in HIV-positive young uh, young people. And I'm not going to go into too much detail on this. This was, more, you know, sort of focused on adolescents, but a little bit of a a teaser for our next webinar, which will focus uh, on, on adolescents specifically, as there was quite a bit of um, discussion around adolescents uh, at the conference as well. And I think, Jessica, that's already been scheduled, if I'm not mistaken. We're in the process of scheduling it. But okay. yes, that's on the agenda. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So so apologies for sort of rushing through these. And I think these were, you know, really fantastic um, presentations and abstracts that were presented at the conference as well. Um, we have the contact information for most of the authors. If there are any questions or follow-ups on, on these, again, we'll share the slides and, and the abstracts with, it, with the posters uh, out to the group as well. Okay, thank you so and much. I think, you know, mm -hmm. I'm ahead. seeing one question about um, starting the nevirapine-based regimens. And, uh, just to answer that, I think the because lopinivir ritonavir uh, is approved from two weeks onwards, my understanding is that um, the the recommendation and what was done in this in this particular study was to start um, the therapine for the first two weeks of life and then switch lopinivir ritonavir from two weeks gestational age onwards. Okay, thank you, Nandita, for that clarification and for pulling this presentation together, drawing from uh, Dr. Moffinson's slides. Um, we've kept you for quite some time, but there was a lot to cover and a lot of uh, interesting presentations and uh, research to delve into. If you have any follow-up questions, we'd be happy to forward them to the researchers. Um, and if you have any ideas or suggestions for future webinars, we're happy to receive them and consider them. And we also, uh, like Nandita said, we hope to schedule a, a similar webinar that's more focused on adolescence, as there was a lot of uh, research also um, more related to the adolescent age group. Um, and I'd also like to thank once again all of our presenters and researchers who carved out the time in their busy schedules to present here and provide all of you an opportunity to interact with them directly. And again, a, a thank you to the co-chairs of the Child Survival Working Group, uh, Nandita, Nandeputa of UNICEF, who worked um, behind the scenes to uh, pull this together as well, um, and Molly Rivendera of CDC. So thank you all for joining us, um, and we will share the recording and uh, follow-up summary and presentations with you following the webinar as usual. Thank you, and uh, have a great day. Thanks, everyone.